Welcome to episode 78 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. We get to speak to retired agent Bob Hamer, who served in the FBI for 26 years. While in the Bureau, Hamer, a Marine Corps veteran, worked organized crime, gangs, terrorism, and child exploitation cases. Much of his career was spent undercover, successfully posing as a drug dealer, contract killer, international weapons dealer, white collar crime criminal, and a pedophile. In this episode of FBI Retired Case File Review, Bob Hamer is interviewed about his undercover role in Operation Smoking Dragon, an investigation that dismantled an international smuggling ring that brought into this country illegal drugs, cigarettes, and counterfeit $100 bills known as the North Korean Supernote. Bob Hamer received numerous awards throughout his career, including the coveted FBI Director Award for Distinguished Service and five United States Attorney Awards. He has written and consulted for television and is the author of three award-winning books and three novellas. His nonfiction book, The Last Undercover, details his FBI undercover career. Now, this is actually the second time we've had a chance to speak with Bob Hamer. As you recall, in episode 65, he was interviewed about his undercover role infiltrating the North American Man-Boy Love Association, NAMBLA, and his successful undercover role as a pedophile, which enabled him to gather the evidence to charge men seeking to travel overseas to exploit children. Episode 65 is one of my most popular episodes, so I'm glad to have Bob back. This is a fascinating case, especially when you learn about the counterfeit $100 bills. Hey, if you have any, make sure they don't say made in North Korea. Before we get to that episode, I just have a few things that I want to tell you. For those of you who have had an opportunity to listen to my interview on the podcast, Best Case, Worst Case, where I talked about my best case, a Philadelphia charity Ponzi scheme, which is the inspiration for my next book. I hope you enjoyed it. I've gotten a number of inquiries about whether or not I also talked about my worst case, and I did. I'm not sure when that will be posted, but it was the first time that I talked in public about an event that occurred during my first six months as an FBI agent. So when my worst case interview comes up on the best case, worst case podcast, I'll be sure to let you know. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the audio book of pay to play A number of you have emailed me or have asked about it on my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author. And yes, it is still in production. It will be ready sometime in September. A professional voiceover actress by the name of Melissa Franks with a nice, deep, sultry voice is narrating pay to play. I've listened to several of the chapters that she's completed so far, and it sounds so good. Her voice is perfect for a crime thriller about corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. I, of course, will let you know when that's available. But in the meantime, I want to thank those of you who have picked up a copy of the print book or ebook. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself, or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping to support the podcast and helping to defray the cost of me continuing to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. So, thank you. Now here's the show. I'm excited to welcome back to FBI Retired Case File Review, Bob Hamer. Hey Bob, how are you? Hey, Jerry, thanks for having me back on. I appreciate it. Well, I had to have you back on because the episode that we did 
about your role as an undercover pedophile has been one of my most popular, which is strange to say, but it's one of my most popular episodes. And I think it's because uh, not only because the case was fascinating, but because, you know, as a writer of of novels and nonfiction books, you're just a great storyteller. So I had to have you back on. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks. All right. So what are we going to be talking about today? Another one of your great undercover roles, I, I assume. Yeah, actually, the, at the same time I was undercover in NAMBLA, which we talked about the last time, I was the undercover agent in a, in a group one called Operation Smoking Dragon. And we were uh, targeting a Chinese organized crime syndicate. So it was, uh, I was working, actually, I was working three undercover cases at the same time, NAMBLA and then a Vietnamese gang case and then this Operation Smoking Dragon. But Operation Smoking Dragon turned out to be a, a fantastic case. And... Uh, yeah, so we, three years, it went way, well beyond where we thought it was going to go. As as you well know, a lot of undercover cases started the letter A and they ended at B. This thing started at A and we went all over the alphabet. So um, it literally began with counterfeit cigarettes. The The Bureau had real concerns with what was coming into our ports. I was in Los Angeles at the time. L.A., between L.A. and Long Beach had two of the largest ports in the world, and the FBI had a real concern about what was coming in to the United States through these ports, but we also knew that counterfeit goods, particularly counterfeit cigarettes, were coming into the West Coast, and they were filtering down to these mom-and-pop grocery stores that were owned by Middle Easterners who were using the proceeds from counterfeit cigarettes to finance terrorism overseas. So the Oh wow. The fake Marlboros were being used to to finance Hamas and Hezbollah and other terrorist organizations. So the bureau took kind of a, a as you look at at a snake, they took a, a two-prong approach. They went after the head of the snake, the people that were bringing in the counterfeit cigarettes, and they went after the tail of the snake, these mom and pop grocery stores that were using the proceeds to to finance terrorism. So fortunately for me, I got to go after the, the head of the snake, and uh, it, it turned out to be a, a tremendous experience and, and a great uh, undercover operation. We had set it up at the time. I was, I was well into my 50s. We had an informant that I met one time. I mean, I could not pick this guy out of a lineup now, but the the informant told the case agent that they really uh, they would appreciate an older Caucasian man, and if he had a warehouse that and could uh, store their counterfeit goods, that probably would work. So we set up a warehouse straight out of Hollywood. We had the video cameras, we had the audio all set up. I had a, a fairly large warehouse, had my offices uh, wired up. Met the the top importer of counterfeit cigarettes on the West Coast, who we had identified as the, as the top importer of counterfeit cigarettes. Uh, met him. He kind of bought my act that yes, I had I had a warehouse. He could store my product in the warehouse. I had access to long haul truck drivers, so I could help them transport their cigarettes throughout the United States if that's what they wanted. Uh, occasionally, I had contacts at the port. So maybe once a month, just depending on when all my people lined up on the same schedule for a, for a fee and some bribe money, I could get their containers through uh, the ports of, of Long Beach. It turned out they were bringing in 40-foot containers, and a 40-foot container probably held well over a million cigarettes. And what was so fascinating about it was at, at the time in Los Angeles, a pack of cigarettes was going for four or five dollars a pack. Well, a carton of counterfeit cigarettes was going from anywhere from eight to ten dollars a carton. So you had ten packs to a carton. So when you stop and look at it, the proceeds from counterfeit cigarettes exceeded the, the proceeds from drugs. And you had all these different agencies working drugs, but nobody was working counterfeit cigarettes. ATF, 
alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, they were probably primarily tasked with investigating tobacco uh, products, but they had some important things to do too. They were more ex- concerned with with explosives and guns and and all of that than actually looking at counterfeit cigarettes. So there was very little law enforcement interest in this. And um, I sold myself in that first meeting to this guy explaining what I was able to do. Within about a month, he brought us a container of uh, a 40 foot container of counterfeit Marlboro cigarettes. And what was amazing was if you look at the, the, if you looked at a counterfeit pack of Marlboros that they produced over in China and North Korea, they were doing it in both countries. Uh, the counterfeit Marlboros looked identical to the real Marlboros. If you looked at the packaging, you couldn't tell the difference. Uh, the only difference being that if you smoke the cigarette, the ones in China and North Korea were made out of Chinese and North Korean tobacco, and the ones in the United States, the authentic Marlboros, were made out of um, Virginia, Kentucky, and North Carolina tobacco. So the only difference was in, in the flavor. But in terms of appearance, you couldn't tell the difference. I, I do want to, to make sure that we don't take too much credit away from ATF, because the only reason that we're interested, we're not interested really in the cigarettes themselves either. It's the terrorist financing that got the FBI involved in the case. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, we weren't, we weren't, well, yes and no. I mean, we were going after it as a Chinese organized crime case and the terrorism aspect. So it was, it was a twofold approach by the FBI. The JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, they were looking at the the mom and pop grocery stores. The the Asian Organized Crime Squad was looking at the the Chinese that were that were bringing this in. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the cigarettes that they were bringing in, as 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 we'll see as the investigation goes on. But it was one of their primary means of making money with, with the counterfeit cigarettes. When you're talking about this terrorist aspect. And I'm, I'm not going to ask a lot of questions. I just want to get focused on, on what we're talking about here. But when you're talking about the terrorist aspects, you're not talking about Chinese terrorists, are you? No, I no, I, we're I, talking about Middle Eastern terrorists. The, okay. Yeah, the Hezbollah and Hamas and, and, and other terrorist organizations. Uh, uh, so these the mom and pop stores were run by? Middle Easterners. Okay. All right, good. Because in my mind, I don't associate... China and terrorism, but now I have a better understanding. I'm I'm clear, and I think maybe there might have been a couple of listeners who might have been confused about that too. Within about a month, the guy brought me a container of counterfeit cigarettes. Now we had uh, we had a rule we weren't allowed to let these go into general commerce without being tested by the CDC. So we had to take samples of the cigarettes that they were importing into the United States had to be approved by the CDC to prove the Center for Disease Control to prove that, that they weren't uh, any worse than American-made cigarettes. And eventually, I mean, I had made up a story that I would move this container around various warehouses to make sure that it wasn't being followed by customs or any law enforcement group. And then within uh, within about a week after the container arrived in Los Angeles, um, then we would release the the cigarettes to the, to him. Now this was on the subsequent containers. On this particular container, he brought the container. He had gotten it out of customs. He brought it to our warehouse and, and left it at the warehouse. Uh, we opened it up and still sent the samples to the CDC, and they came back and said, "No, these are. I mean, it's made out of Chinese tobacco, but it's not. There's it's not any more dangerous than smoking an American cigarette." So now we have a a 40-foot container of counterfeit Marlboro cigarettes sitting in our warehouse, and he tells me that he wants it delivered to the East Coast to a uh, Russian organized crime group that's operating out of Allentown, Pennsylvania, but is actually distributing the cigarettes in New York. At the time, New York cigarettes, I think, were going for $10 or $12 a pack by the time they tacked on all the taxes. So... Literally, a carton of cigarettes was going for less than what a pack of cigarettes was going in in New York. 
we delivered the the container back to Allentown, Pennsylvania. I met five of these Russian organized crime figures. Uh, by the end of the day, they'd taken me to a house there in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I was watching the Russians affix counterfeit tax stamps, New York tax stamps, to the cigarettes. Now, um, I don't know how many of your listeners pay attention to cigarettes, but each cigarette pack has a tax stamp on it, which is a, a local or state tax stamp. stamp. And um, so you just to have the counterfeit pack, Without the tax stamp, you couldn't sell it in a grocery store. You'd either have to affix a genuine tax stamp, which you'd have trouble getting because these are counterfeit cigarettes, or you have the counterfeit tax stamp. So they had counterfeit New York tax stamps that they were putting onto the individual packs and then shipping them into New York. So we were able to identify this, uh, for lack of a better word, a safe house in Allentown where they were doing this distribution. And the FBI opened a case on on the people back in Allentown. Uh, everything went well, and I returned to California. My people, a guy that I had met was very happy because the container was delivered. Nobody was arrested. Everybody made a lot of money. And now I'm I'm kind of in, and it it begins to grow from there, where he introduces me to a couple of his associates. Uh, one of those associates was a female who was actually the girlfriend of the top exporter of counterfeit cigarettes out of China. He was wanted in the United States, fled the United States, went to China, and now he was putting together the containers in China and then shipping the containers here into the United States uh, in, in the West Coast. So we've identified who we think to be the biggest importer of counterfeit cigarettes on the West Coast, the girlfriend of the top exporter of counterfeit cigarettes on, on, in China. From there, it just started expanding into other people. Now, at the same time we're doing Operation Smoking Dragon, there's a, a sister case on the East Coast called Operation Royal Charm. And there were a couple, uh, great undercover agents, FBI agents that work, were working that case. And they were doing similar things on the East Coast with Asians that were smuggling in cigarettes to the East Coast and distributing them along the East Coast. So now on the West Coast, I'm dealing with with John and, and Jenny, who was the girlfriend of the top exporter. And pretty soon, we're, we're doing, we're moving along, we're socializing, and one day she brings me 500 pills of ecstasy. Now in my oh. career, I'd probably purchase 10, 20, 30 million dollars worth of heroin and cocaine, but I really hadn't seen any ecstasy. And I just said to her, what is this? I don't, you know, what, I don't understand. One of the keys when you work undercover, if you're stupid, be stupid. And so I was stupid. So she sits there and explains to me, well, this is ecstasy. Uh, it's made in Amsterdam. We ship it into Montreal and then it's smuggled across the border and we bring it here into, uh, Los Angeles. This is the finest stuff. Well, how do you ingest it? So she, she lays out everything that we need to know for for this for for evidence if we ever go to court and say, it's hey. real <laughs> yeah so i called my case agent and said hey do we want ecstasy and he says yeah let's go ahead and do ecstasy so i had told jenny uh part of my backstory was that my grandfather had died i had a trust account i was a pretty savvy investor i wasn't a licensed broker but i had a couple clients that i managed their money uh, off the books, and I would take a percentage of the new profit. So it, it allowed me, you couldn't check up on me, but it allowed me to explain my wealth and my connection. So when she brings me the ecstasy, I said, well, I, you know, let me know, I, or let me check. I've got a client who owns a bar down in New Orleans. Let me see if he wants ecstasy. So when my case agent said, yeah, let's buy the ecstasy. So we went ahead and now we bought ecstasy. Well, Next thing, after we successfully buy the ecstasy, she brings me crystal meth and wants to know if we want crystal meth. So now we've expanded from beyond the counterfeit cigarettes to ecstasy and crystal meth. Uh, within a couple weeks, I get a call from the Russians back on the East Coast. 
they've got stolen cars and they want to know if we're interested in purchasing stolen cars. So now we wow. fly, I fly back to the East Coast and now I'm buying stolen cars. So we go from cigarettes to ecstasy to crystal meth to stolen cars. And so for all of these people, you are like a distributor. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm the middleman. I, when they, when they're giving it, when they're giving me the drugs, they think I'm doing it. You know, I'm distributing it to my people. I'm a, a middleman. Uh, with the counterfeit cigarettes, I'm just a facilitator. What we were doing with the counterfeit cigarettes is they're bringing the containers into our warehouse. We've got local law enforcement or the feds, and they're bringing in smaller trucks to unload them from the 40-foot containers and then taking off down the road. Uh, we've got maybe Highway Patrol pulls them over miles and miles from my warehouse and pulls them over for a taillight violation. Uh, we may follow them to where they are delivering the cigarettes to a to another warehouse. Uh, we may wait a couple days and ICE and or Customs uh, goes in and seizes the cigarettes out of the warehouse. So a lot of the cigarettes that they're bringing in aren't even being distributed, but we're we're ripping them off and they don't. It never tracks back to me. So we're we're seizing cigarettes. And we're identifying the, the bigger scope of the conspiracy. Now, I'm starting to make a lot of money uh, because they're paying me for all of these services. And at one point, I now I'm introduced to five, six other guys in this in this group. And I'm charging them $60,000 for the services that I'm providing. And at one point, my case agent just said, you know, we're, we're making so much money here. Why don't you just trade drugs for your services? So I tell one of the one of our main targets that uh, instead of charging him sixty thousand dollars, I want two kilos of crystal meth. We had we had arranged for the the two kilos. We had arranged for the sale, or I had provided my services. They were supposed to bring me the two kilos of crystal meth. It turned out that the load car up in Seattle, the, they were bringing the drugs in through Seattle. The load car had broken down, caught on fire, had been in an accident or something. I I don't I can't recall the details, but my target wasn't able to deliver the the, the crystal meth. Our case agent checked and here lo and behold there was an accident up there in the, the Washington area where they discovered crystal meth but uh you know they'd seized the crystal meth. So now we we're, we're, we're kind of we're dragging this thing out Eventually, John brings me two kilos of crystal meth. When we had the crystal meth analyzed by the DEA lab in National City, California, they said it was the highest quality crystal meth they'd ever analyzed. And John is telling me that it was made on a Chinese military base. So, you know, now we're expanding, expanding far beyond what we ever thought we were, were going to do. Uh, it got to be almost kind of humorous because I'm I'm dealing with so many more. Obviously I'm white, I'm a Caucasian, and I was I was referred to as the quipple round wound eye because I, I used a an arm crutch I had like House did on the T V show and I I complained that I had osteogenetic osteomyelitis a result of spondylolithesis, which they never quite understood. Fortunately I never dealt with a medical doctor. And uh so they just they just referred to me as the crippled round eye, but the language barrier. I was crippled round eye, and I'm I and, mean, I'm going and they I'm, trusted you. Oh yeah, they, oh, a, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm there's no I'm going way to parties. There'd be yeah forty or fifty people to party, and I'm the only Caucasian in this party. And at one time, uh, Jenny, the female, it was her birthday, and so I took a camera in. And I'm just I'm lining all the targets of our investigation up together, and just taking pictures of everybody smiling, and no one's no one even says takes a second look at me or thinks anything of me taking pictures of everybody in the room. So we had uh, great photos of many of the targets of our investigation. Uh, it just it was just it was I I was so into the group that they were offering me things that I really didn't even want to get involved in, but it just kept 
it just kept expanding. But why you? I would think that in this country we have so many, you know, Chinese Americans that they would have been able to find somebody who had a warehouse, who had these facilities. Why would they trust you? I I, I don't know the real answer to that. I think there was there, there was a lot of fear of they were getting ripped off within their own community, and they wanted somebody that was trustworthy outside of their community. And that's and why they, once I proved myself with the delivery of the Russian container and nothing happened, uh, you have to understand they were investing about a quarter of a million dollars into each of these containers. So when that first container went through and nothing happened, they made a quarter of a million dollars. They, they you know they made a profit after investing a quarter of a million dollars. So I had I had tremendous cre- credibility as as a result of that. Why the why the source said a Caucasian would be more trusted than 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 someone from China? I really don't know. So now we're. We're, we're moving on in terms of the number of people that we're, that we're identifying, the people that are part of the, the distribution of the counterfeit cigarettes, the people that are involved in the drugs and the ecstasy. Jenny eventually introduced me to her contact. Uh, I've, I've never had this happen before in a drug deal, but I had convinced Jenny that I didn't really like dealing directly with her because she was Michael, the, the, the top exporter in China. She was Michael's girlfriend, and I was fearful that if something happened and Jenny got arrested for having drugs, that it would reflect badly on me and it would ruin my relationship with Michael, who's sending over these counterfeit cigarettes. So I just, I got Jenny to introduce me to her source of cigarette, of, of drugs, and I promised her, I said, look, you stay out of it, introduce me to your guy. And then I'll pay you a piece. Every time I do a drug deal, I'll kick you a piece back or I'll reduce my fees to you when I bring in one of your containers of cigarettes. Because she was bringing in containers too, as well as uh, several of the other people I was dealing with. So that she bought that and then introduced me to her ecstasy and crystal meth supplier. So now we've, we're, we're beginning to expand. And my case agent at one point says, look, we really need some weapons. I mean, you well know, Jerry, that if you're going to have a press conference, you got to have weapons on the press conference table. So I am, I'm literally driving on the 60 freeway in Los Angeles, the Pomona freeway. Uh, one of our main targets is in the passenger seat and I'm just driving there and I, I said, Hey, one of my top guys, one of my best clients, owns a PMC, a private military company down in Alabama. He gets hired out by all these third world countries to do uh, security. He does a lot of work over in Africa. Can you throw in a case of AK-47s in your next container of counterfeit cigarettes? Because he needs the weapons to train here before he goes over to Africa. Just then, you wouldn't believe this if you saw it in a movie just then a flatbed National Guard truck goes by with a tank on it. And the guy looks at me and he points to the tank and he says, I get you tank. He said, I get you anything but nuclear weapons. He said, I just get shipped wow. for country down in South America. And we're going, holy crap. I mean, a tank. All we're looking for was, you know, a nine millimeter to put on the press conference table to make it look like this was a, a dangerous case. So the next thing I know, he introduces me to another person that we had never met here in Los Angeles who's introducing me to Chinese generals and we're getting catalogs of weapons and we end up negotiating a uh, a 60 million dollar shoulder fire missile conspiracy we're going to buy QW2 missiles that they had in containers over in China it was going to require that uh, you can't legally ship weapons from China into the United States. So we were going to have to pay off some foreign government officials in other countries that would verify that their country received the weapons, and then they would change the bill of lading in China and directly ship the weapons into the United States. So 
now it's it's expanding far beyond the counterfeit cigarettes that that we had originally was the goal of of the original investigation. So I'm I'm having telephone calls with Chinese generals. We're we're having meetings in back rooms in in Los Angeles and one of the funniest things that happened, we were in a back room. There's no smoking in California restaurants. So we're in the back room where everybody's smoking. And I mean, literally, it was the these smoke-filled back rooms where, where we're eating. And the, the waitresses are bringing in the, the food to us. And everybody, there's cigar smoke and cigarette smokes and all this stuff. Well, the one guy, Mr. Chen, has all of these documents for this, for these weapon sales that are going to be uh, on paper going to these other countries, but actually coming directly into the United States. So he's holding up this paperwork and it's all in Chinese, which I, I don't read right. Chinese characters. And I point to a signature and I said, Mr. Chen, who signed this document? And he goes, he like lice. And I, I looked at him. I said, I don't understand. He like lice. He goes, he like lice. He like I said, lice. Mr. Chen, I don't understand. He, he like lice, you know, breakfast ready. And I said, Condoleezza Rice? This is like the Condoleezza Rice of China that signed off on this paperwork? And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He like lice. <laughs> it would have been, if it would have been a movie, I would have said cut, print, you know, let's, <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to move on to the next act. So it, I mean, I, I don't even understand how you were able to interpret that, but uh, good for you. Yeah. So we, we've now gone. So we started out with counterfeit cigarettes. We've gone to ecstasy and crystal meth, highest quality crystal meth DEA lab has ever seen. We're getting stolen cars from the Russians back on the East Coast. Uh, we're now involved in this shoulder fire missile conspiracy. And... North Korea counterfeits our $100 bill. It's called a super note, and it's a, a near-perfect replica of our $100 bill. They actually talk about it in Rush Hour 2, about how North Korea was doing this. It's an act of war to counterfeit another nation's currency. So now I was tasked with trying to get the super note, because we knew that some of the materials that were coming out of China were coming out of North Korea. We we I had gotten counterfeit pharmaceuticals. They, they were counterfeiting Viagra and shipping them to uh, Canadian uh, medical distributors, uh, pharmaceutical distributors. So I had I had gotten some counterfeit Viagra, and I don't mean just little blue pills. I mean these were in the the medical containers with all of the the documentation, just like a pharmacy would get this medicine. We had gotten counterfeit clothing. Uh, there were there were all types of counterfeit goods now that that were being shipped in. At one point, they were counterfeiting thirty seven cent pat postage stamps. This was a little be- right before we started doing the forever stamps. So we had the largest seizure ever of counterfeit postage stamps uh, that were. This is like a, were this in, is like a kitchen sink case. Every, oh yeah, yeah. That well, could possibly be made. They're counterfeiting. No, I it, to one of the guys I said one time. I said, you know, your idea of of copyright is right to copy. And he goes, yeah, he said, whatever you, whatever you want, you bring us to it. We make it for you. I mean, that's what it was. So there was, there was the clothing, the counterfeit pharmaceuticals, the, the postage stamps. And now we were tasked with trying to get the super note, the counterfeit money. Now the, the operation Royal Charm was also trying to get the super notes out of that. So I start putting the word out to these different I'm dealing now with about five or six groups underneath this umbrella organization. And I started putting the word out that I needed good quality counterfeit money. And the story didn't make a whole lot of sense, but they bought it because I would actually open escrow accounts when I was doing, when I was doing the criminal acts with them. So when they, when they had a counterfeit container, uh, being shipped over, I would open up an escrow account so that if that container, if I didn't deliver that container, this money would all automatically transfer into their bank account. Of course, I knew 
I was going to get the containers through because we were working with customs. So I explained to them that I had safety deposit boxes where I had actual money in the safety deposit boxes that were part of my escrow accounts. And I was tying up that money. I mean, I had a quarter of a million dollars, a half million dollars in these safety deposit boxes that I could be investing and making real profit. So I needed them to bring me quality counterfeit money that I could fool people into believing that that was real money so that now I could take the real money out of the safety deposit boxes and invest it. I know you're probably sitting there shaking your head going, this doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense, but they believed it. So now they begin bringing me counterfeit currency. And as your listeners probably know, Secret Service has the primary jurisdiction in investigating counterfeit currency. So the first $100 bill they they brought me was, I, I gave it to my case agent, he gave it to Secret Service. They came back and said, no, this is made out of, this is made in Colombia. We've already seen this. And I kept telling them that it had to pass the Home Depot test. That if, if I could get the bill to go through the, the cash machine at Home Depot and it wouldn't get kicked back out, then I would take their money. So the first bill they brought me was from Colombia. The second bill they brought me, Secret Service said, no, this is from Macau. The third bill they brought me, Secret Service said they'd never seen. And then two different people actually brought me the super note. And, and that's what you wanted. You didn't want all wanted, the other ones. The North Korean super note. So we began negotiations for the North Korean super note. Um, they wanted 35 cents on the dollar. It was interesting when they brought me the, the two samples. They wanted 35 cents on the dollar. We gave to Secret Service in Los Angeles, the Secret Service, the analyst in Los Angeles came back and said that it was real. And mm -hmm. I kind of laughed and I told my case agent, I said, if they're saying this is real money and they're selling it to me for 35 cents on a dollar, I'm going to mortgage my house and I will buy as much real money as they're willing to sell me. And I said, they're saying this is counterfeit. So they sent the money back to Washington, D.C. and Washington, D.C. came back out and said, yes, this is the super note. And what wow, had happened that's, was... That's how good it is. That's how good it is. Well, uh, uh, let, I'll go even a little bit further on this. What had happened was when they first started making the bills um, and there were discrepancies, the, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and, and the Treasury Department and Secret Service was putting out to the banks and the merchants, well, you know, you, this is how you can tell that this is counterfeit um, you know, Barack Obama is not on the hundred dollar bill. It's it's Benjamin Franklin. So they were changing the plates. Well, it got to the point that North Korea was changing the plates every time they would. There was a notification sent out. So now there were three top secret marks on the bill that they had never even they had never notified even the the local analysts out in the field as to how to identify these bills. It turned out that one of the guys that we eventually arrested had laundered a million dollars of these counterfeit bills through the slot machines of Las Vegas. When I, when I went to testify against this guy in Las Vegas, they had blown up the bills, uh, enlarged them as court documents. And I, I walked into the, the assistant United States attorney's office and he said, well, which is the counterfeit? And I pointed to the one bill. And I said, oh, it's this one right here. And he said, no, that's the real one. The counterfeit was actually better. And you would have to look at a, at a, at a $100 bill, at the old $100 bills. There's, at one of the points, there's a clock. And in the clock, the minute hand on the counterfeit, on the real bill, just barely goes over the clock face, just sticks out just a little bit. It's almost as if, the ink ran, uh, like there was like a, a little nick in the plate and the ink ran. In the real, in the counterfeit bill, that little minute hand didn't extend just a, a, a tick beyond the clock face. And then there was another little, in a pillar, there's a pole that was not the same size. In the counterfeit bill, it's just not the same size. It's almost like 
they screwed up and it should have been the same size. And in the counterfeit bill, it's the same size. So those were two of the top secret marks. You couldn't see, you really couldn't see it with the naked eye. It would take a magnifying glass or uh, a microscope to see those, those imperfections. That's how good this money was. And That's it was, amazing. and it was going through the slot machines in, in, in Las Vegas. So we eventually, uh, I order up uh, a million. I actually uh, order up through this case. We, we get a total of 4.5 million. Uh, the case goes down between Operation Royal Charm and Operation Smoking Dragon. We indict 87 people. The, when the thing, the case went down, I, I believe it was August 21st and August 22nd. It was kind of a fun couple of days for me because I would, I would set up meetings with three or four guys and we'd be sitting there walking out of Starbucks or sitting in a restaurant or sitting in my office and all of a sudden the FBI would rush in and they would uh, throw all of us in cuffs and put those guys and everybody in individual cars and put me in the back of a car and take us to the FBI offices and then they'd release me and I'd go back out and set up another meeting with a couple different guys and FBI would come in and arrest me, and so I got arrested a couple different times on on that weekend as we as we went through and made eighty seven arrests. So you got to tell us whatever happened to the tank. Oh yeah, did yeah. You? We we never ordered the tank. We did the. Oh, you didn't. You didn't uh, order it. Though. Yeah, we did. We we didn't. We didn't do the tank. Um, we we just stuck with the uh, the QWT sh- or QW2 shoulder fire missiles at 1.2 where where we were starting to get it, we're going on 3 years now so this this case began in September and then it would have it would have been the rest went down in August so had we gone into September it would have been 3 full years in this investigation but we were getting to the point where i i couldn't do things I mean, the Bureau wasn't going to be, give me $60 million to buy these shoulder fire missiles. So that just turned out to be a conspiracy. But we were setting up a meth lab in North Korea. And it, it, it turned out, it didn't make any sense to me. But fortunately, my case agent, who was maybe one of the best case agents I worked with throughout my career, he was working closely with DEA. And the deal was we were going to finance a, a meth lab in North Korea. We were going to make 600 kilos of crystal meth. I got 200 kilos. The two guys that I was dealing with here in the States were going to get 200 kilos. And North Korea was going to get 200 kilos. But it was a one-time use only. And we, uh, it would be protected by the North Korean government. But then once we did our 600 kilos... Then we had to turn the the factory over to North Korea, and it turned out that the same uh, manufacturing machines used to make crystal meth could make laundry detergent. So it was going to become a laundry detergent factory once once we did it with the uh, once we produced the 600 kilos of crystal meth, which as they're explaining this to me as the bad guys are explaining all this to me, uh, it's like, is that really true? And my case agent checked with DEA and it turned out to be true. Again, the FBI can't finance a drug operation. So we weren't, we couldn't do it because we couldn't actually create a, a lab where you were making the, the drugs. But it was, uh, I mean, it was just fascinating. I, at one point, I'd purchased a counterfeit uh, a passport, and so they were going to get me. You couldn't get a passport to get into North Korea, but they were going to get me a counterfeit passport from another country that had rights. So we were talking about going into North Korea. The Bureau wasn't going to let me do it. But Oh, I was going to say, you know, is that it, something it that like, you would have done? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would have been uh, that, that would have been exciting to, to have done something <laughs> like that because uh, I kept – I kept m- making it very clear that my investors wanted to make sure that this was safe and how is it safe? How can you guarantee me that this is safe? And, uh, 
uh, you know, I want paperwork to prove to me that North Korea is going to protect us and, and all this. I mean, just, just kept playing it up. And so I finally, because I knew the arrests were coming down in August, we had set it up that, um, in that last week of August, we were going to transfer all the money over to the, to the bank accounts that they'd given us so we could begin the production of the crystal meth. Turned out, turned out to be a great case. So the, the, the crippled round eye, the, the Caucasian did a great job and the, and we had Caucasian agents, uh, too on the East Coast, white guys that, that, that did a great job in Operation Royal Charm. This is so fascinating for me because the, the, the focus of the case kept expanding and, and expanding. So at the end, what was the, the, the main objective? I, I take it that somebody else has broken off and somebody else is now concentrating on the terrorist financing at the mom and pop shops. Now you're yeah. focusing just on this huge criminal enterprise of Chinese counterfeit goods. Right, yeah. The, the Joint Terrorism Task Force was working that whole, the counterfeit cigarettes down at the mom and pop grocery uh, store level. And I was working with the Asian Organized Crime Squad on on that whole the whole aspect that we were dealing with, at least on the West Coast. So, yeah, we just we we were focusing we were letting JTTF handle everything with the mom and pop grocery stores, and we were we were doing the other thing. And I guess what your case did, what your role was, was in helping them identify. Which of those mom and pop stores were receiving this counterfeit cigarette? And, sure. Okay, so so you did have a, a, a an important role in that. But once those cigarettes got to those stores, then your part of that case was over, and you continued working on other counterfeit goods uh, cases. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was. I never even dealt with the mom and pop grocery stores. That was that was several distribution levels removed from me uh, but yeah so it it, it worked out there uh, there weren't any other undercover agents involved in that aspect of it it was just a matter of following the, the following the cigarette trail um, i had a lot of fun in the case i mean i i always tried to make all my undercover cases fun but um it was a little easier okay. kind of because of the the language barrier, but uh, when give the, us some the, examples of some some fun or amuse, other well, amusing the, things that happened. My main conduit for the weapons deal, I I love country music, and Charlie Daniels is uh, he's one of my favorite singers. So he had a song called "Uneasy Rider," and if your listeners are familiar with the song, it's a story of a long-haired hippie that goes into a redneck bar and gets confronted by these rednecks. Well, there's a line in there, so I had it. I had this line cued in my undercover car. So there's probably six or seven times where one of the main bad guys gets into my undercover car, and when I turn the ignition on in the car, the first line you hear on every undercover tape, the very first line, is from Eddie's writer, and it says, "Don't you know what this man's a spy? He's an undercover agent for the FBI," and that's. That's the first line on on every tape, and I would and and none of the other none of the people that were in that car with you, none of the bad guys heard that line and were suspicious. No, no, and I would there there was Jenny, the the one female, the, she would be in the car with me, and there were a couple other guys and everything, but I would I would have a CD and I'd be playing Jailhouse Rock, Folsom Prison Blues. I mean. Anything that had some kind of criminal or prison theme to it, I would play. And literally, Jenny is dancing in the car. She's she's rocking out to, to uh, jailhouse rock and everything. Uh, they just, you, you are evil. <laughs> yeah, they, just, they never caught on. When, when I was testifying in uh, in Las Vegas, and one of the the auto recordings. You could hear Elvis Presley singing Fools Rush In in the background. And the defense counsel made a big issue out of this. And <laughs> I just looked at the jury and I said, hey, I played music in a lot of my undercover cases. <laughs> it was just sort of the way I got along. When I did the 
the, when they gave me the two kilos of crystal meth, it was in my undercover car, and I had it cute. I mean, I kind of envisioned this as being a, a, a TV series, and you'd need a soundtrack. And literally, I had it <laughs> timed that just as the guy handed me the two kilos of crystal meth, in the background, you can hear Hil- Harold Milville and the Blue Notes singing, If You Don't Know Me By Now, You'll Never Ever Know Me. <laughs> So I, this, is, this is so wild. You've created your own personal soundtrack or playlist as you did your undercover roles. That's absolutely fascinating. I, I take it, I know you've written so many books and, and, and you know, I'll have links to, to a couple of those in the show notes, but did you put that in a book? That, that needs to go in a book. Yeah, yeah, I, I talk, in, in the last undercover, which is the true story of many of my undercover dealings, um, yeah, I, I talk about the use of music, and I think my protagonists in a couple of my, my novels play music too, so, oh, it's, it's the one cool. way, I, I think it's the one way to prevent burnout is just, just to look for the humor. I found lots of things online about this case, and actually uh, on the FBI website, you know, there's a, a number of articles that outline this case, and, and they have a, a an interview with you about it. So I will link those to the show notes for this episode, too, in case anybody's interested in, in looking at a little bit more detail. But how does this all end? Most of them pled out. I think every almost everybody that pled out got deported so we we sent a lot of people back over to to China. It probably doesn't mean a whole lot now. We could have indicted some North Koreans and obviously we it, it wouldn't do any good, but they kind of used this case as sort of bargaining chip to bring North Korea back to the six party talks a few years ago. It is the reason for the new $100 bill. I mean this case and a couple other cases, but we we were able to prove that North Korea was counterfeiting our hundred dollar bill. So that you now have the new hundred dollar bill. Uh, the old bill. I was undercover at the racetrack. Uh, we were doing a race fixing undercover back in '96 when when the, those hundred dollar bills came out. And man, it was such a big deal because they. They came out, and I remember everyone was so excited to see the new $100 bill. This is in 96. So now that's the bill, the one that was in 96 that was designed to be that you couldn't counterfeit. That's the one that the North Koreans were counterfeiting. And now wow. kind of from that undercover investigation to this later one in the 2000s, uh, is, is now we have the, the new $100 bill and the technology that, that they have in this new one is – yeah, maybe North Korea and counterfeited. I don't know. We know from our intelligence, North Korea was using the hundred dollar bill to kind of finance their nuclear terrorism research and technology to counterfeit. I mean, to to pay for to pay their spies with the counterfeit bills. I mean, this was propping up their economy because they were using our hundred dollar bills and in, in what they were doing. Oh, isn't that ironic? They were using. Counterfeit bills from the United States to create and finance weapons that one day they may use against us. Sure. Scary. Absolutely scary. See, there's another, there's another book. There's another book there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure you do the same thing. I see a story and, and, and everything I hear. But are those $100 bills still circulating? Or are all those bills taken out of circulation? No, the, the, the bills that, the $100 bills before the ones that they just issued a, a year or so ago, there's still some in circulation. Wow. So there's, there still could be some there's, of this, uh, yeah, I, North Korean it's, it's super imp- note. Right. It's impossible to determine how much counterfeit money is still out there circulating because it's only the, as I understand it, it's only the Federal Reserve banks that can detect the counterfeits. So the, the, your regular banks can't even detect the, the super notes. So there's no telling how much of that money is still in circulation. 
All right, so 87 people pulled into this investigation, and you said that most of them were deported. Were there American citizens that were also involved? And, and uh, you know, what was your role in having to – did you have a role in having to testify uh, in, in those trials? I'm, I'm not aware of any American citizens. Uh, I mean, there could have been. I, that was more the case agent took care of that. Um, okay. So I – and I didn't testify in any deportation hearings or anything like that. I think that was just a matter of submitting the paperwork and for those that pled guilty or were convicted. And how much of this role, because it sounds like you were you were working this case and the NAMBLA case and another case at the same time, how, as an, how do you as a UCA, as an undercover agent, how, how are you able to separate these identities and figure out what you said in this particular case and what you're saying and a- another case? My backstory was similar for all three cases. I mean, I was, I was still the, the older man that was handicapped that used the arm crutch. The only difference was in NAMBLA, I liked prepubescent boys, and in the... Operation Smoky Dragon, I was an international arms merchant. So that that wasn't difficult to keep separated at all. And then the Vietnamese gang case that I was working, it was still the same story. I, I had a warehouse in L.A. and was doing this. But in the Vietnamese gang case, I was just buying crystal meth and ecstasy that they were that they were selling. What undercover name were you using? Were you using the same undercover name? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was always always the same name. Uh, Robert William Wallace, William Wallace from Braveheart, Freedom. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then it, it, it is funny. My one of my first undercover names that I ever used was Robert Jason Bourne, and and that was from the the books. This is long before the movies ever came out. So it was Robert J. Bourne. I always kept my first name is Bob, so that you know if I ran into you on the street and you said Bob, and the bad guy said, Oh, I thought you said your name was Chuck. So I always kept. So I had Robert Jason Bourne and then Robert William Wallace from the movie Braveheart. Well, when the Chinese, when I, I ordered a counterfeit American passport from the Chinese and, um, shoot, now I'm trying to think of the name, but it was oh, Robert David Webb. And that was Jason Bourne's real name. If you saw all the, so that, that counterfeit passport and then the, the Robert Webb, is actually on display at the FBI at, at headquarters in in some some display. I've never seen it, but an agent was there and saw the the passport on display and took a picture of it and sent it to me. So there was a method to my madness. There was always something in in the weapons case. Are we always referred to the the guy that was that owned the PMC down in Alabama? It was actually Bruce Willis's character in Tears of the Sun. So just just screwing with people. I know that's exactly what you were doing. So if if you ever ran into, you were lucky that you never ran into a bad guy that was really into country music or to you know spy novels or, or thrillers, you know, or, or those type of movies because they might have started to you know notice a, a pattern there with you. But uh, I guess you were never caught. Yeah, I, well, I one one of my first assignments when I was Robert Bourne, uh, Robert J. Bourne, the the guy asked me what my last name was, and typically it isn't like TV. I mean, typically you don't give a lot of information out because the more information that they have on you, that if as a bad guy, the more information the guy's got, if he gets busted, he can tell the cops who you are. So we were playing this playing his game and the, the bad guy said what's your last name and i said you know let's not play this game he said no what's your last name and i said it's it's born and i turned to my to the other bad guy and i said you know that book the born identity that's really about me i said i'm I'm really with the cia and both of them laughed and they said well just as long as you're not with the fbi we don't care <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! This this is hilarious. This really is all the all the different, uh, as we would call them in in the writing business, Easter eggs and and uh, red herrings that uh, you've thrown out throughout your cases. 
So we're just about uh, done here. And I know last time I asked you some of these questions, but, you know, uh, I'm going to ask them again. When did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? I I came in came on active duty in 79. Um, I'd been in the Marine Corps, but I was, I was a judge advocate. I was a lawyer in the Marine Corps. I hated being a lawyer and there really wasn't. There wasn't the excitement in the courtroom that I was looking for and I knew the I knew the FBI at that time was interested in lawyers, so I applied to the FBI and, and came in, and I, I thank God literally every day that uh, he allowed me to be in the FBI because it, it was 26 years and, and just a great career. I, I couldn't have asked for for a more exciting career. And after that, you took on the exciting career of becoming a writer and an author. Are you working on anything new now? Uh, yeah, I, I just finished a book, although I I was hired to write a guy's story, an interesting story. He's a, uh, a Vietnam veteran that lost both legs and is now an evangelist. So I I helped him write his story, and that that would be coming out around Veterans Day. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm not working on any novels now. I kind of do it one project at a time and looking for a new project now, but... I want to give you the last word, either to sum up this fascinating case, Operation Smoking Dragon, or, you know, your career. So what would you like to say? Well, you know what? I, I, I really appreciate, Jerry, what you do. And to let the people know that the FBI agents out there that are working hard for them and working for this country. And, you know, the FBI has been in the news a lot lately, not for the best reasons. And one man does not make the FBI the FBI is not one man. There are thousands and thousands of us that have taken the oath to defend this country against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and and that's what we do. And it's not what's coming out of Washington, D.C. that's the FBI. It's that, that individual agent on the street that's, that's literally risking his life or her life day in and day out to, to make this country safe and to to go after those people that are tearing at the very fabric of our society. And uh, I'm proud to have had a role in that. And with the other law enforcement agents and the first responders that are out there in our military, that's what makes this country great. And we're free because of people like that. We're free because of people that have taken the oath and have lived up to that oath. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Bob, you'll find links to newspaper articles and an FBI website story on Operation Smoking Dragon, and you'll find links to Bob's book, The Last Undercover. And don't forget to check out his crime thrillers too. Bob Hamer's books are included in the FBI Reading Resource a list of books about the FBI written by FBI agents. To get a copy of the FBI Reading Resource, all you need to do is sign up for the FBI Retired Case File Review Reader Team. Just go to my website and sign up when you see the pop-up. As a member of my reader team, once a month I'll send you an email that will bring you up to date on the FBI in books, TV, and movies and keep you posted on my author journey. So talking about books, I have my crime fiction recommendation for this week, The 11th Hour, A Woman's Murder Club Mystery by James Patterson. Now, I have to confess, this is the very first James Patterson book I have ever read. There are probably literally hundreds of them, but I never picked one up before. You would think if I was going to pick up a book in a series, I would start with the first one. So I was a little confused about the characters because I had missed so much of their development leading up to this 11th book, but I am now reading the first book in the series and will be able to give a more complete recommendation about James Patterson's Woman's Murder Club series. But in this one, the main character, Lindsay Boxer, 
A detective with the San Francisco Police Department is pregnant. She is still doing her job when she discovers that a millionaire has been murdered with a gun stolen out of the department's evidence locker. She's also working another case that involves the bizarre crime of two bodiless heads that were elaborately displayed in the garden of a famous actor. She works these two cases while under the stress of a strained relationship with her husband. So I recommend The Eleventh Hour by James Patterson, but don't do what I did. Start with the first book in the series, First to Die. I'm reading it now, and I'll tell you what I think about it during next week's episode. So while you're at Amazon picking up a copy of The Eleventh Hour by James Patterson, don't forget to also check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.